everybody. I'm Tom Vassell. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. This episode of Board Game Breakfast is sponsored by Pandasaurus Games, coming out soon with The Mind Extreme. Mind, a very popular game in which everyone is trying to think together to play cards. Well, The Mind Extreme takes that. There are now two decks of cards, one going up, one going down, and some of the rounds you play blind. If the mind was too easy for you, then you're going to really love the Mind Extreme. A couple of important announcements we want to talk about today here, folks. First of all, if you wanted to back the Dice Tower and didn't have a chance to or missed it or whatever reason, you can do so now in our backer kit. That's at DicetowerKickstarter.com. Secondly, today I'm going to be starting a mini marathon of sorts of Tom's Solo Gaming. It's going to start at 10 a.m. today, and we're going to go as long as I can handle it because I'm going to be playing the games. I'm going to be talking straight. It's, I'm going to be handling the camera, running the live stream. It's going to be basically me. I think my daughter's going to bring me lunch. <laughs> so we're going to see how long we can do that. I have a bunch of solitaire games, maybe a game or two that I'll be able to play with you all. So hopefully that will be a fun time or entertaining time, or maybe I'll fall asleep on camera. Uh, we're just going to have to wait and see how that works out. But with all that being said, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. Let's get going. For the 16th time on Board Game Geek, Tony Aykroyd has run the Geek Madness Tournament. Uh, this is just basically a silly, fun exercise where they take many of the highest rated games on Board Game Geek, put them in a, a matchup, think the you know sports tournament style, and people then just vote on them and we narrow it down to one winner. The winner is being announced today. I don't know who has won at this point. Uh, when I'm looking at it here, I'm seeing it to the final two. It's an interesting thing. You think it would line up exactly with uh, Board Game Geek's top-ranked games, but it won't because people's opinions change over time. To me, this is a little bit more interesting because when someone goes and ranks a board game highly, they, not, they might not necessarily come back and change it, while right now what's being played is, is fascinating to me. Now, still, popular games are going to win, but there are surprises along the way. Gloomhaven got a buy, and this one came in and was immediately eliminated uh, by Power Grid. Which just seemed like an you know it's an odd matchup to have, and you know anything could change next time. The the two games that are in the final have been in the finals before, and so this is the. It's fun, right? Statistics don't mean anything. I see people who say, oh, it doesn't matter if a game's ranked highly on Board Game Geek. Well, it, it does matter. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you enjoy it or not. You know, you can enjoy anything you want. Uh, but rankings matter because we look at those and it gives us some talking points. And you might say more people enjoy one game than another. So this is just a fun exercise. I watch it every year to see who wins. Um, and it's just an entertaining thing to pass the time, but at the same time gives us some, some information about where games are and what games are becoming popular, what games are kind of fading out. So that's the Geek Madness Tournament. You can find it on Board Game Geek. Nautical theme, check. Dice drafting, checked. Record placement, checked. Here's what I think about Rec Riders coming up. Hi, it's Stella. I always find dice drafting mechanics fascinating. Dice get rolled, then players draft the dice from common pool. Well, in Rec Riders, that's what you do. Players roll the dice on the box lid, also determine what sea creatures are available. Then draft the dice and assign the workers to collect treasures according to which dice number they take, display treasures in exhibit, and collect aquarium piece. When you collect your rewards with your dive up, Placement determine which treasure you can get based on the location and divers next to you get rewards too, if any. You collect the treasures for order fulfillment and end game objectives. You can also buy aquarium sets for points. Your point is represented by this cute little crab by the way. At the end of the game, they move around the corner of the box lid. Most points wins. So I like dice, I just prefer not to be affected directly by the roll. With dice drafting, I still get to use the dice, but it affects everyone in the game, so not just the one person. This game is pretty light enough for families and plays quickly. 
There's nothing bad I can say about it. Mechanics are familiar to gamers. Nothing is new, but it combines them well. I do like it because I like the mechanics and theme. And these days, I play more solo game, and the game has solo variant. Another tick for Wreck Riders. Well, thanks for watching. We are on the Dice Tower How to Play and Pocket Playthrough videos and Meeple University on YouTube. See you next time. Well, we get to watch a lot more TV and things now during this time period, and so I finally got around to watching X-Men Dark Phoenix. Now, if you watch this channel, you know I'm a huge Marvel fan, and when it comes to the comic books and such, I tend to like the X-Men a little more than the Avengers, although I flip-flopped a little bit on that, but I've always liked the X-Men. Now, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is way better than the X-Men movies have been. Real briefly, I enjoyed the first X-Men movie. It was very excited about it. I don't think it's aged well, but I thought it was a good movie. The second one was okay. The third one I hate it. It's my least, it's my least favorite of all X-Men movies. And then when they came in with the new series, Days of Future Past, I was the, the first one was fine, but Days of Future Past was is my favorite of the group. And then the the last one was okay with Apocalypse. I didn't think it was great, but I didn't think it was bad either. Um, so I was very excited about this one. The Dark Phoenix is one of my favorite storylines in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Then the reviews came in, and they were just over overwhelmingly bad. This movie was universally derided to the point where I did not go watch it in theaters and when I had the opportunity to watch it consistently I just never got around to doing it. Well I finally watched it because I had time so. Well it's one of those times where the reviews were so bad and so negative that I don't think the movie could have been bad enough to mean that. So it was better than I had anticipated. That being said, I was not a huge fan of it, and there are several reasons. Um, and I guess there will be slight spoilers here. One, I thought the, the villains of the movie, first of all, in the trailer, I thought it was the White Queen. It's not the White Queen. They're just aliens. Um, they're never defined. They're really bad actors. I, I, or I, at least I thought the acting from the aliens, I felt no threat from them. I felt nothing from them. They were like the, a plot device. Uh, there was just nothing there. They never seemed to pose that much of a threat. It was just a bleh. The villains were pretty, pretty poor. The movie was also a lot smaller than I thought it would be. Dark Phoenix in the comic books, Jean Grey, the Phoenix Force enters her, and she ends up destroying an entire world. And which is, you know, she doesn't mean to, it's the Phoenix, blah, blah, blah. But they put her on trial. It's big. Here, the set pieces are pretty small. There's a, there's a few fight scenes in the movie. One takes place in a house. One takes place outside, like in a compound. One takes place on a train. And they're not bad. I mean, the special effects seem to be okay, but they, the stakes in this, in this one felt really small. Um, the most interesting and exciting set piece was at the very beginning when they take their, their plane, the Blackbird, up to go and rescue some guys from a space shuttle. The actors are also, I mean, P Professor X and Magneto, Magneto especially, those are they're done really well. Jean Grey, who's carrying the movie, um, she was okay, but most of the X-Men, they just felt wooden. And there's little to no humor in the movie. Uh, a major character dies again? Um, and it just, there's no emotional impact to that. I mean, they try to make it seem like there's an emotional impact, and there isn't. And so I, I, the Phoenix Force also isn't really fully defined. And I don't know, uh, it was really weird to me that they followed almost note by note the ending of the third X-Men movie, which I really disliked. And then they started doing some of the same stuff here. And it, is, that a, is it a remake? It wasn't a very good one. So... Yeah, again, the more I talk about it, the more I'm realizing how much I didn't like it. I didn't hate it. It was There was entertaining moments in it. But at the end of the day, they need to just phase the X-Men out and reboot the whole franchise in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And you can definitely feel the lack of Wolverine, right? Wolverine is a good heart of these X-Men movies. Him not being in this movie at all... You, you definitely can feel that. So, yeah, I'm going to give this one a thumbs down. That's Dark Phoenix. 
Hi, everybody. Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. All right, well, today we're going to be talking about Age of Artisans. This is the new expansion for Architects of the West Kingdom. Uh, basically, this adds a whole different uh, new kinds of cards, these craft cards. It helps you modify buildings with adornments, helps you modify your... Uh, what do you call it, the apprentice cards mm -hmm. with having tools. Um, it adds a whole other um, little artisan meeple, <laughs> which really ramps up your ability to get things faster and faster. Uh, new player powers and a new player color as well. So that's, that's this adds on. It does add on a lot of stuff, but it doesn't really change the game that much, which I view as a nice thing. Um, we would definitely add this anytime we play. There's no reason why we wouldn't play without it. There's no reason why if we were teaching this to somebody, we wouldn't play without teaching this because it it adds stuff to the game without making the game any more complex. Does it change the game? No, not really, but it does make it more fun. So yeah, is this a must-have expansion? I would say no, you probably don't need this expansion. However, if you are a fan of Architects and you've been playing it a lot and you want to breathe some new life into it, you want it. Yeah, this has got a whole lot of new stuff I think you're really going to like. We've really enjoyed it, and we've been playing it a lot lately. If you want to see our full thoughts on this expansion, go ahead and find us on YouTube under Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Thanks so much for tuning in, everybody. We will see you next time. Have a happy, healthy breakfast. Bye, guys. Happy breakfast, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk to you about my experience of playing Welcome To over the internet. Now, both of us, uh, my friend and I, had a copy of the, of the game, so we both had the pad of paper. Now, that's clearly very important. The next bit that really helped out was that they were able to find the objective cards that I'd shuffled out, they found theirs, so they didn't need to be on screen. Then I had the cards, the two rows of cards, turned them over, and then we just played pretty much as normal with as much sort of talking as there normally would be in a game of Welcome To. And it felt like we were sort of sat around the table, even though I was sat at a desk and he was sat sort of on his uh, sofa many miles away. It worked really well and it would be good to know what games you've been going to to play over the uh, internet like this, sort of where one person has been sort of streaming the cards or, or the dice rolls or whatever. And also, I'd just quickly like to say, if you're on Instagram, I'm on Instagram, easto1a, E-A-S-T-O-1-A, if you fancy following and seeing lots of pictures of board games. Anyway, thanks for listening, and I'm Oliver East, signing out. <laughs> So what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, first of all, uh, quite a few reviews. One of the bigger ones, I'm taking a look at the sequel to Orleans, Orleans Stories, uh, Yukon Airways, the new two-player game from Uwe Rosenberg called Fairy Trails. Um, and so you're going to see that. Uh, like I said, I'm doing the solo marathon today. We're going to be doing a top 10 list this coming Thursday. And uh, other things are going out. Roy is doing his showdown on Wednesday. Um, there, there's a lot of different things going up. Eric and I have a podcast going up on Tuesday. If you've never listened to the audio podcast, we're talking about our top 10 games that start with the letter O. Hey, I just mentioned Orleans Stories. Will it make it? Um, well, you'll have to wait and see on that one. Uh, so that's what's going on this week. We have many different things coming through. Uh, and don't forget, every night at 9 o'clock, we are still doing our daily chats. Also, if you missed it, uh, Corner to Corner, a show I do with Rado. Rado runs through. We moved that to once a week on Tuesdays. And this week, it won't be on a Dice Tower channel. It will be on his channel, but same show and same great host. Or at least one of the hosts is great, him. Um, watch it there. All right, let's keep going. Hey, hey, fellow sports fans. The reality is it's spring, and I'm super excited about that, but I don't think any of us are getting popcorn and Cracker Jack anytime soon. So what I wanted to bring to you all today is three games that you can bring to your tabletop so you can have a little bit of baseball action with your friends and family that are also fans of the big game. Let's get started. So first up is Baseball Highlights 2045. In this deck builder, you're set slightly in the future where human players play along with cyborgs and robots to entertain the crowds, to attract them back to the big game. Now this one is for one to four players and from Eagle Griffin Games. And a little Oriole told me that there is a wicked sweet trophy for anyone who wins the world championships. 
So next up to bat is Bottom of the Ninth from Greater Than Games. This one accommodates one to two players and it puts you right at the excitement of the end of the game. It's dice rolling, a little bit of bluffing, you're the pitcher or the hitter, and your team only needs to prevent one or get one to win the game. My recommendation, always play with the Hannah Mullins card. And finally, Stratomatic Baseball. You know how the player scorecard looks a lot like an Excel spreadsheet? What if you could play the Excel spreadsheet? This one is perfect if the statistics and the history of the game is even more important to you than the sound of the bat hitting the ball and having a dog in the stands. From just the highlights to every pitch of the season, there's something that you can bring to the tabletop for any type of baseball fan. So grill out your dogs, put your cap on, and bring the big game into your house. Um, hope you're having a fantastic time. If you enjoyed the content, check us out at Girls Game Shelf, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye. Hi, it's Ryan from Nights Around a Table, and this is The Secret Life of Board Games, a series where I interview board game creators about the Easter eggs they've buried in your favorite games. Belfour is a worker placement area control game from Tasty Minstrel Games. Illustrator Josh Capel has packed the board with tiny doodles referencing all kinds of neat stuff, but you'd better bust out your jeweler's loop because most of them are microscopic. This shifty fellow is hawking the five famous resources from Catan. The Tasty Minstrel Games dragon, whose name is Dargon, is singing for his supper over by the wall. This guy's not into it. This donut looking thing is a scout ship from another TMG game, Terra Prime, which Josh also illustrated. There's a coin from Terra Prime up here on the player board. The ruler on the same board is made from 100% ent free wood. Lucky for Treebeard. TMG's head of development is Seth Jaffe. Seth's board game geek username is carved into the wood on the permit board. And parts of Josh's own signature are here and here. These maple leafs are a nod to the fact that the game's artists and designers are all Canadian. Well, so am I, but I don't go around bragging about it. TMG CEO Michael Mindus is hawking copies of Terra Prime and Train of Thought down here. Characters from the webcomic The Order of the Stick show up down here. Up in this gatehouse, there's a goon reading the Belfort rulebook. Board Game Geek's old mascot Ernie is hanging out by this tower. This particular critter is a Dray Beast from Conquest of the Fallen Lands, another Josh illustrated game. This blacksmith is hammering out three pieces of metal that spell out TMG. There are a ton of other secret doodles that Josh told me about that I don't have time to show you here, but if you'd like to see an extended cut of this episode, join me at my channel, Nights Around a Table. There's a lot of talk now about playing games solo or playing games online. And we've talked about that on our channel, you know, to take things like Tabletop Simulator, Tabletopia, Board Game Arena, and play games with other people, or to sit down and play a game by yourself in the solo mode. And you better believe that every board game that comes out in the next few years is they're going to try to shoehorn in a solo mode, if anything else, because of how much they're being played right now. Now, I know that there's a very strong solo board game community. One of my contributors, the person who's editing this very video, Mike Delisio, uh, is uh, in the solo game community. And over the years, we've, we've made gentle fun of solo gamers and such. And we, I pulled back from that for many different reasons. Um, and, I mean, we still make fun of it. We still run with the joke, you know, Tom Basil doesn't play solo games. Right. Um, but... I will say that with this pandemic and with this forced quarantine that many people are under, uh, they were, there's a lot more solo games, like I said, being played, a lot more things. Will that continue when this is over? And that's what I'm kind of curious about because it's kind of forced upon us now. We can't play games. I mean, I'm fortunate I have a large family, so I have an opportunity to play a lot of games with, with my family. But I really, really miss playing games with my friends. I really miss playing games with my game group. And so I can't do that. So I'm forced to look for other means, whether it be solo or that. And I've talked to a lot of, of friends about how these things that we do now, like DoorDash and Amazon and things that people may have used a little bit in the past and now are using even more so, will this continue when the quarantine's lifted? And I wonder about that. You know, it's interesting. We are currently forced, in a sense, to play games in a different way. 
Will that continue? Obviously, some things will go back to normal as time goes by. Obviously, we want to play games with people face-to-face if we can. But will we see a more of a resurgence in the solo board game community? Will we see more people playing online even though they don't have to in the future because they got used to doing it, because they've learned how to do it? I talked to my kids uh, today. Uh, We have a little family meeting each day, and I mentioned to them how the world changed dramatically after 9-11 and how, you know, things that, and I talked about airport security and stuff and how it was different before 9-11 and then after 9-11 it changed and I said it and it never went back. It was the new normal. And that's going to happen here to some degree. There's going to be some new normal that's going to take place. I don't know what it's going to be, but this way we play board games is a minuscule part for sure. I'm not trying to make it like this is an important thing, but this is our hobby. This is what we talk about. And the way we play board games, is that going to change? Are we going to see more games and more people playing solo even if they don't have to? Are we going to see more people playing online because now they've figured it out and it's not that hard, or at least they're figuring it out? I'm still not convinced online board gaming, Tabletop Simulator, Tabletopia, I'm still not convinced they are as simple and easy as they could be. I still think we're still a ways away from them being just flawless, easy to jump into. But people are being forced to figure out these systems and learn how to do them. And because of that, it is easier for them to jump into it in the future. So this is just fascinating. It's something I'm thinking about to see where we go from here on out. Like you're seeing me do, for example, today I'm doing that solo marathon. I probably would never have done that unless this is what we got. This is what I can do. So to that end, how will that change how we game in the future? Well, there's no way to, to know for sure. We'll find out, hopefully, soon enough. Hello, and welcome back to Retro Board Game Corner. Here I have Dead Stop, published in 1979 by Milton Bradley. This is a two-player game in which you're using your deductive powers to try to stop your opponent. Let me set this up and show you how it works. This is what the game board will look like set up. Each of you and your opponent are going to have six pawns, and before you start playing, you're going to have to put a different color ring in each pawn, and throughout the game, it will remain hidden from your opponent. On every turn, you're going to do two things. You're going to draw a card and move one of your pawns, whatever it says on the card, and basically it's just move ahead or move back one, two, or three spaces. So after you've moved one of your pawns, then you will try to guess one of your opponent's hidden colors on one of his pawns. When you're trying to guess one of your opponent's pawns, you're just going to take a ring of any color and put it on the pawn. Now this just signifies that you've already called out that color. If you get the color correct, you can go ahead and cap it off with one of your own pieces. This signifies that you have correctly guessed that color pawn, and wherever that pawn is at, it just immediately stops and cannot advance forward anymore. But it, can, it, it is still able to move backwards. When a pawn is on the safe space, that means that your opponent cannot try to guess what color pawn it is. The game is over when all of the pawn's colors have been correctly guessed, or there's no more rings to guess with. So you're just going to tabulate your scores by whatever row your pawn is at, minus any points, and whoever has the highest point total wins the game. Remember playing Red Light, Green Light as a kid? Well, this, I think, is the board game version of it, where you're trying to get your pieces as far as as possible before the game is over, with a hidden aspect with it. Well, that's all the time I have for now. If you have a comment, comment below, or you could tweet them with me at RetroBoardGamer. And as always, may your rolls be high. Hi guys, and welcome to another call video. We probably only have maybe you know, a handful of these left to do, but uh, in the meantime, enjoy and uh, see if you can guess. The scoundrels and skull ports. <laughs> Lords of, it's Lords of Waterdeep. I don't know yes. why I started reading that Because this is the expansion. <laughs> That's why. So this is a great intro worker placement game that will be staying, staying good. Yes. We haven't yeah. actually discussed this, so I had a feeling you'd say that. Like you said, great beginner worker placement game 
I still love it. I still love this game. I love doing the quests in it. And yeah, yeah, adding the expansion into this um, adds some bigger quests that are harder to do. Also, like some corruption where you can really yeah. get a lot of resources, but you have to kind of take corruption later. Depending on how much corruption goes out to people, is how many negative points those are. So I definitely recommend the expansion. And it's yes. not too hard. Like you can teach new people with the expansion pretty easily. Absolutely. But regardless, Lords of Waterdeep is an excellent yeah, game. I love it. To get people started. I love it. Legends of Andor. This is cooperative, correct? It is cooperative, yes. Wow. I'm looking at the back of this. And I'm like, I have I not got this, this one cover. specifically for you because I know you like this fantasy realm and stuff. And we actually like this one quite a bit. I but remember that we did. It's yeah. not going to stay in the collection. I was going to say that it is. Really? <laughs> Yeah. And I'm very shocked. Because I just remember having a blast with this one. I yeah. do not like co-op games. It's a This one's one of the really puzzly co-ops. Um, you can kind of fight and stuff, but fighting is not a main part of the game. Weird. I totally thought you were going to Yeah, it's more of a game. puzzle than anything. We've played a number of, of the uh, missions, but anyway. Yeah. Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. I'll tell you right now, guys. This one is leaving. I cannot stand this. <laughs> I, I, And it's so disappointing because yeah. I love Sherlock. I really was ready for a juicy mystery. It a was lot of people so, love these. I know. It was nonstop reading. Yeah. That is all that I felt like I was doing. And I, to me, that Lots was of reading. Fun. It's pretty difficult. I guess we're just not very good at these or something. We but think at Chronicles of Crime, too. Like well, we do. It. But like Chronicles of Crime would be my choice for <laughs> oh, a yeah. sleuthing adventure. Yes. Anyway, guys, thank you <laughs> for joining us. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye. Alrighty, that's it for another Board Game Breakfast. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. Thanks to Pandasars for sponsoring this episode. Thanks to all you folks who still watch us and still come and, you know, spend time with us virtually, whether it's in our Facebook forums or on the Board Game Geek forums, and just we spend time back and forth during this time. If you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling low, and I certainly understand that, then watch our channel, watch our daily chats. Those are a positive thing. We're there just to have a good time, to kind of put aside the cares of the world just for an hour or so and just come in and talk about games and various things. They're a lot of fun. We have a lot of wonderful guests that have shown up on them and we will have more lined up for the future. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.